name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The gospel that is for today uh, always provides this wonderful sort of second part, which um, talks about the children coming to Jesus. Actually, that's the window that we have in our church that uh, provides the image for it, which is very nice. And usually when this reading comes up every three years, uh, I think I've joined most clergy by talking about the children and sort of kicking the marriage and divorce question down the road. So this week, forgive me if I wade in on the other side of it, but uh, um, I do think it's uh, an important topic to address in terms of um, our gospel, and in in part because one of the the greatest blessings that I have as a priest in the Episcopal Church is actually twofold. One, I'm allowed to get married, which is not true in every denomination, and two, um, I do get to do marriage preparation for couples, uh, sometimes that I'm marrying, sometimes that another priest is marrying somewhere else. I get to officiate at weddings and pronounce nuptial blessings over a couple, and I also get to deal with marriage counseling, which uh, is sort of up and down sometimes, and every aspect of marriages. And um, as you know, I think, different denominations treat marriage, divorce, and remarriage quite differently. Um, Our church, the Episcopal Church, has a set of rules that deal with how really every aspect of church life is ordered, and they're called canons. And you can Google it. If canons 18 and 19 in the Episcopal Church specify how our denomination treats marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And I think, for what it's worth, the gospel does invite some thoughtful and pastoral reflection on all of this. It comes up every three years on Sunday morning, and as I said, more often than not, um, it sort of just gets glossed over. And so let's jump in a little bit, um, and I hope that some of this is edifying for all of us, A, to know what the canons of our church actually do say about marriage, remarriage, and divorce, and also why I think those canons matter for all of us, whether we're married or not. Now, it would take me way too long, and you'd all fall asleep if I actually started reading the canons of the church. Those are like legal documents. So I will spare you that and try to summarize them as best I can. Uh, The Episcopal Church, if you want to get married in the Episcopal Church, we invite any two persons, at least one of whom must be baptized, and they both must be able to get married legally where the marriage is happening. Um, And they can ask to have their marriage solemnized or blessed by an Episcopal clergy member in an Episcopal church, and or. You can do both. Um, Any clergy member may choose not to solemnize or bless or even do the marriage prep for any marriage for any reason whatsoever, and I'd never have to give you a reason. I can just say no. Um, But related to that, the canons around marriage actually don't supersede any other canons in the church, and in terms of marriage, what that means is just because you can get married in an Episcopal church doesn't mean you can get married in any Episcopal church. Anything that happens in this church literally has to go through the rector, which is me. And so you can't get married here even if I, um, which is sometimes people will ask, well, can, can my cousin come in who's an ordained online minister and do the wedding here? And the answer is no. Um, we do Episcopalian weddings here. Um, Well, can we use your field or your hall? No, that's on the site too. We just do Episcopalian weddings. Um, The Episcopal Church authorizes a number of liturgies for marriage. There are some of them in our prayer book, but it's worth knowing that there's a number of other liturgies authorized in the Episcopal Church, Eucharistic liturgies, morning and evening prayer liturgies, burial liturgies, and marriage liturgies, that are also available for people to use. And if you're going to have an Episcopal church wedding in a church and or by an Episcopal clergy member, 
it must conform to one of those authorized forms. And I think this is probably the most important part. Prior to the solemnization or blessing of any marriage in the Episcopal Church, the couple must sign off on a declaration of intent, which is a theological statement about what the marriage means. And I'll read that to you. We understand the teaching of the church that God's purpose for our marriage is for our mutual joy, for the help and comfort we will give to each other in prosperity and adversity, and when it is God's will, for the gift and heritage of children and their nurture in the knowledge and love of God. We also understand that our marriage is to be unconditional, mutual, exclusive, faithful, and lifelong. And we engage to make the utmost effort to accept these gifts and fulfill these duties with the help of God and the support of our community. The theology of marriage in the Episcopal Church doesn't start and end there. It's just kind of a summary. Um, and for what it's worth, one of the things that you see w when you do a wedding, and because people of all different types and ages come to, do, uh, to ask to get married, and there's a selection of different scripture passages that you can read. And when someone is getting remarried, which happens somewhat frequently, and they're older, um, the readings that tend to deal with young children are often not used at weddings, right? You can assume that sort of thing. Um, but the church's role in marriage doesn't end after the wedding day. The canons state, and this is sort of the hard part, the canons state that it is the duty of any married person whose marriage is imperiled, if possible, to seek counsel from a member of the clergy. And I do that from time to time, and there's also rules uh, around how I do that. When counseling anyone in an imperiled marriage, it is the duty of the clergy member to act first to protect and promote the physical and emotional safety of those involved, and only then, if it be possible, to labor that the parties may be reconciled. And the church has a role if a marriage dissolves or ends. You may think, oh, I'm in the Episcopal Church. We don't do annulments here. We do. They're in the canons. If you are divorced um, or if you are in the process of an annulment or something on the state, you can ask the bishop to annul your marriage. Um, you have to get permission for that from the bishop. And remarriage, likewise, happens in the Episcopal Church, um, but if there was a divorce involved, you have to get permission from the bishop and uh, formal permission through that. Um, and the, the pastoral counseling that I do around that, which again happens more often than I ever thought when I was ordained. I thought I'd be marrying a whole bunch of 25-year-olds. Uh, but realistically, uh, that's not always the case, which is good. So these canons are a pastoral and practical framework for marriages in our denomination. They answer basic questions around who can or cannot get married in the church and by the clergy, they give some basic expectations and responsibilities for married people, and also the responsibilities and discretions for the church and the clergy. And you might ask how the canons align. We got into this by today's gospel. How does it align with the gospel passage today, which is a little heavy-handed on some levels, and a little different than the other gospel passages in uh, that uh, St. Luke or St. Mark uh, tell when they tell this same passage. So, for starters, it's important, I think, to note that Jesus is answering a question by his adversaries, the Pharisees, who were trying to test him, not to lift him up, but in the hopes that he will fall headlong into a trap that they've set for him. And they ask a question around a topic, if you are married for any length of time, I am, or have been, or know anybody who has been, you can probably say that it's pretty much a complicated topic, no matter how you address it. Relationships, marriage in particular, uh, are rarely answered with black and white answers, right? There's a lot of gray there sometimes. And there's a lot of issues where it's not that simple is usually the correct answer before you begin a much longer sort of deep dive on something. And I think Jesus' answer to the Pharisees, where he explains to them 
that marriage and divorce isn't just that simple. He gets a little bit into it. Does Moses give permission for divorce? Yes. Are there reasons for that? Yes. Does that mean divorce is a good thing? No. Are there reasons for that? Yes. You may recall that this is not the only time a religious authority tries to entrap Jesus around marriage. There's a really kind of juicy story about the Sadducees. Do you remember the Sadducees? There's a joke about them. They're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. right? The Sadducees come because they're grinding an axe about the resurrection, and they come to Jesus to try to put him in a trap, and they use marriage as their mechanism for this. You've probably heard this, and if you have, you certainly remember it. They give an an absurd hypothetical, a somewhat absurd hypothetical, about seven brothers, the first of whom marries a woman, and he dies. And then the next brother, number two, marries the same woman, and he dies. And three, and he dies. And four, and she dies. And, And he dies. All the way through to the seventh, and he dies too. You could get into how unlucky or something that whole thing is, but we don't go there. Their question is... Not, is this okay, or is it an unhealthy system or something? Their question is, is in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Right? They've mapped it out. There's seven marriages there, so how is this going to work out? And as an aside, as someone that does do marriages for people that are um, widows or widowers, and remarriages after a divorce, sometimes really horrible divorces, uh, that were marriages that went all wrong, I really can't think of a nastier way to speak about people who've gone through the sadness of losing a spouse or who've gone through uh, the joy of remarriage than to kind of track that out and say, oh, well, when you get to heaven, how's this going to work out for you? Jesus' response is pretty blunt there, too. You are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like angels in heaven. If you've ever wondered where that expression comes from, that sometimes clergy poo-poo for what this is worth, um, about, oh, when you die, you become another angel in heaven. Well, where do you think you got it from? Right here, Jesus says, but they're like angels in heaven. Uh, We don't really know what that's all going to look like, but it doesn't look like the messy world we live in right now with all the complications we have. The Episcopal Church, like the Law of Moses, And like Jesus recognizes that marriage and all human relationships, because if you actually take the time to read the Gospels, he weighs in on all sorts of things. Marriage, money, relationships with your family, you name it. It's complicated. And it's rarely helpful for someone to take an adversarial position demanding that we pick a side or for someone to present a hypothetical situation. What if this happened to you? Well, it hasn't. And usually those hypotheticals demand impossible solutions because we haven't lived through them yet. Marriage is lived in the world that we do live in, that we move in and breathe in, and it's like every relationship. It's complicated. I'm married. It's complicated. It requires constant support and nurture. Many marriages are happy and lifelong, but it's also true that some marriages dissolve. There's always pain when a marriage dissolves, even if the end result is relief that a bad, harmful, or abusive marriage has finally come to an end. It's still painful. And the Episcopal Church and her clergy try as best as we can to offer pastoral support for all who seek holy matrimony, for all who are married, for all whose marriages have ended, and for those who are seeking to remarry whether they're widows or widowers or divorced. Now, I began by noting that the gospel today invites us all to reflect on marriage. And I think it does. And I can tell you I've kicked that can down the road every three years when this reading has come up. So if I've dropped the ball today or said something that you don't like, at least it was the first time I've tried. And maybe I'll get it right next time. The church is involved in marriage because the church is involved in life. Right? In life. We live life. And doing the best we can 
in every situation that we get to, we as Christians ask for support from our Christian community and from God in every aspect of our lives, including and especially our family relationships. So wherever you are on any of this, I think I do want to ask everyone to pray for and to support all married people and all those who are seeking to be married and those who have been married and have had challenges in their marriages and those who are married and have challenges in their marriages. Don't be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees whose hardness of heart saw the challenges of marriage and the challenges of life and the pain of divorce and even the joy of remarriage as nothing other than a nice little way to trap Jesus. Get him to say something that's not really what they wanted to hear. Pray that you can be someone who supports and nurtures relationships, especially holy matrimony. And never forget that not only is it Jesus Christ who himself commanded all of his disciples and followers to love one another as he loved us, he didn't just talk about marriage, he actually did his first wedding, one of my favorites, the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And I'd like to close with three prayers. The first you probably are not familiar with, they're from the marriage rite. And they're actually not about the couple, but they're about those people that are witnessing the marriage. So the first one is actually for all married people that happen to be at a wedding. Grant that all married persons who have witnessed these vows may find their lives strengthened and their loyalties confirmed. The second one is for anybody that's at the wedding at all. Grant that the bonds of our common humanity, by which all your children are united, one to another and the living to the dead, may be so transformed by your grace that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where, O oh Father, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign in perfect unity now and forever. Amen. The last prayer. Now, today is October 3rd. Every year on October 4th, it's St. Francis Day. And at 5 p.m. tonight, if you want to come back, you're welcome to, to bring your animals. We're blessing animals. That will make sense of some of the earthy and animal-y hymns that we are singing today. But there's a prayer that you probably know. It's attributed to St. Francis. His feast day is tomorrow. It's used in many contexts. Most often, it seems to be used in divisive contexts um, or in contexts where people are trying to deal with some problem. And that's good. But I think it's a much broader prayer and can speak to any number of contexts. And I do, in, in particular, ones that are positive. And I hope you'll pray it for yourself and for your relationships. And especially for people who are in relationships and what your role might be in that. And especially for people that are married. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.